Have you ever said something and been mocked for it, only to be proven right? You might sympathize with Bob. Bob was born October 5, 1882 in Worcester, Massachusetts. Bob was a sickly, yet curious boy. He was interested in nature and the heavens, and so his father bought him a telescope to encourage his interests. His father also taught him how to charge static electricity using the family's carpet. Bob was inspired and began an experiment, believing that he could jump higher if the zinc inside of a battery could be charged by scuffling his feet on the gravel. His mother warned him that if he succeeded, he could go sailing away and might not be able to come back. Bob agreed, mostly because he wasn't jumping any higher at that point. His father gifted him a telescope, a microscope, and a subscription to Scientific American. Bob was fascinated by flight, to the point he attempted to construct a balloon out of aluminum at age 16. We know about these events because Bob was an avid diarist and documenter. Bob was a skinny and unwell boy. He would suffer from stomach problems and bronchitis, to the point he fell behind his classmates by a whole two years. Due to being bedridden, however, he became an avid reader and was a regular at his local library. When his health returned, Bob likewise returned to school as a 19-year-old sophomore in 1901. His sick time activities paid off as he excelled in his schoolwork. As his grades rose, so too did his curiosity. Bob began reading books on mathematics, astronomy, mechanics, and composition. As a side note, Bob read some of Samuel Langley's papers on aerodynamics and how birds flap their wings differently to control their flight. While Bob agreed with most of Langley's work, he wrote a letter to St. Nicholas Magazine with his own ideas. The editor declined to publish the letter, stating, Machines will not act with such intelligence. At Bob's graduation ceremony, he was his class's valedictorian. He gave a speech that perfectly encapsulates just who Bob was. Just as in the sciences, we have learned that we are too ignorant to safely pronounce anything impossible. So for the individual, since we cannot know just what are his limitations, we can hardly say with certainty that anything is necessarily within or beyond his grasp. Each must remember that no one can predict to what heights of wealth, fame, or usefulness he may rise until he has honestly endeavored, and he should derive courage from the fact that all sciences have been, at some time, in the same condition as he, and that it is often proved true that the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Bob enrolled at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in 1904, where he earned his Bachelor of Science. Bob moved his graduate studies to Clark University in the fall of 1909, where he earned his Master of Arts degree in Physics in 1910 and his doctorate in 1911. In 1919, Bob published a 69-page document, and from eight lines, he earned national mockery. On January 13, 1920, the New York Times published an article mocking Bob's proposal despite the fact that Bob's theory had solid evidence behind it. Despite the ridicule, Bob would respond, Every vision is a joke until the first man accomplishes it. Once realized, it becomes commonplace. Bob did attempt to correct the record, but no matter how he would explain his results, the majority just did not understand. Though he was mocked by the ignorant, his work was understood by other scientists some of whom were inspired to experiment themselves. Bob would work alone with his team of mechanics and machinists for many years as a result of the ridicule from the press and other scientists. He became increasingly paranoid that others might steal his ideas. Nevertheless, he carried on believing in his vision. Bob was very secretive and often had to be pressured to release any of his work. So much so that when he passed on August 10th, 1945, at the age of 63, his work might have died with him, were it not for two things. 
Bob kept meticulous notes on his research and tests, as well as his extensive journaling. The other thing, or should I say person, was a woman named Esther. Esther believed in Bob and saw the value in his work, so much so that she pursued over 200 patents in his name, commissioned his biography, and published his work. Esther's work over the years paid off. In 1959, Bob was posthumously awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, and in 1960, the Langley Gold Medal. NASA even named a flight center after him in 1961. Esther was an amazing woman to do all of that for little old Bob. But then again, who wouldn't do that for their spouse? Esther was married to Bob and took his last name, Goddard. Bob isn't his actual name. It's Robert. Robert Hutchings Goddard, the father of modern rocketry. I wanted to make this video for a couple of reasons. One, I have a lot of respect for Robert Goddard, not only as a scientist, but as a person. He was very driven and stuck to his guns, even when he had newspapers across the country making fun of him. He was being made fun of for eight lines. All he wanted, all he proposed was that you could, with the right tools, could send enough flash powder to the moon to ignite it and be seen through a telescope. That was it. And they made fun of him for it. The other reason was because I was looking for ideas for the next video for October. I wanted to do something October themed. And his name popped up. And his moniker popped up as well. The father of modern rocketry. And I had never heard of him before. And if I have not heard of him, I'm certain that most people haven't. So I'm doing my part to try to spread his name. And as one last little anecdote. When Apollo 11 got to the moon, Neil Armstrong had a copy of Robert Goddard's biography with him. If you have something that you'd like me to research and make a video on, feel free to leave it in the comments down below. I'm always open to new ideas. I'll be back next week. Make sure that you take care of yourselves until then. I'll see you around.